Here we're going to look at a problem from the Turkish Mathematical Olympiad. So this is the 2009 edition and it's question one. So our goal is to find all prime numbers p such that p cubed minus 4p plus 9 is a perfect square. And so I want to give you guys some hints before we look at the solution. This solution is quite involved, but these hints should point you in the right direction. So the first thing that you want to do is like maybe kind of the obvious thing, and that is set p cubed minus 4p plus 9 equal to n squared. In other words, we set it equal to a perfect square of a natural number. And then really here we're trying to find the pairs n and p. Although in the end, we just need to know the prime numbers. And then our second hint will be built off of this first hint, and that is using this setup up here, we'll reduce modulo p and then find an upper bound for p. So in other words, maybe we'll show that this prime number has to be smaller than or equal to something, but that something only has a few prime numbers smaller than it, and we can check all those by hand. Okay, so maybe give this problem a go with these hints, and then we'll come back with a solution. Okay, hopefully those hints were helpful. Now we're ready to look at a solution. So like I said before, our goal is going to solve n squared equals p cubed minus 4p plus 9 for n, which is a natural number, and p, which is a prime number. Great. And so notice that reducing modulo p, like from the first hint, will tell us that n squared is congruent to 9 mod p. Now we want to restrict our cases to when this prime number is bigger than or equal to 9, just so that we don't have to worry about the reduction modulo p for primes less than or equal to 9, although it wouldn't really be a problem. But that being said, it'll just like clear up any of the confusion. So for now, let's assume that p is bigger than or equal to 11. So now we'll take the square root of both sides and that'll give us n is congruent to plus minus three mod p. Great, but now using the definition of congruence modulo p, that means we can write n as m times p plus minus three. Great, so like I said, that's just the definition of congruence modulo p. Now what, we're, what we will do is go ahead and plug this equation that we've built for n into our original equation which we want to solve. So in other words, now we'll have n squared which is mp plus minus three squared equals p cubed minus four p plus nine. So let's see what we get out of that. So squaring this left hand side will give us m squared p squared and now we have plus minus 6mp plus 9. Now notice regardless of there being a plus or a minus here we get a plus 9. That's kind of obvious. And then here we have this is equal to p cubed minus 4p plus 9. Now what we can see is that we can cancel the 9's from both sides of the equation and we can divide this whole thing by p given that p is a prime so it's obviously not equal to 0 so we'll divide the whole equation by p and that will give us m squared times p plus minus 6m equals p squared minus 4. Good. Now what I want to do is get the p parts on one side of the equation and all of the other parts on the other side of the equation. So I can do that by writing m squared p minus p squared equals plus minus 6m minus 4. Okay, great. Now the next thing that I want to do is factor a p out of this left-hand side. That gives me p times m squared minus p equals plus minus 6m minus 4. Great, but now by the definition of divisibility, that tells us that our prime p divides this right-hand side, which is plus minus 6m minus 4. So let's maybe talk our way through that. Notice that p divides the left-hand side. That means that p divides the right-hand side. Or said another way, the left-hand side is a multiple of p. That makes the right-hand side also a multiple of p. Great. Now, the fact that p is bigger than or equal to 11 will tell us that p divides half of this. 
So the fact that P is bigger than or equal to 11 means it is not even, which means it has to divide the odd part of this right-hand side. In other words, now we can say that P divides 3M plus minus 2. Notice I've changed the sign there, but that's like kind of okay as well. So now we have P divides 3M plus minus 2. That means P divides 3M plus 2 or P divides 3M minus 2. Great. But in order for a prime number to be a divisor of something, it has to be less than that thing. So that means that P is less than or equal to 3M plus 2 or P is less than or equal to 3M minus 2. Well, we're going to take the less restrictive one of those, so we only have to work with one. So here we have that tells us that P is less than or equal to 3M plus 2. Great. And that's a good place to finish this board. I'll go ahead and bring that up and we'll continue to the next step. So on the last board, we determined that n was equal to mp plus minus 3. So in other words, it was congruent to plus minus 3 mod p. Recall that in this setup at the moment, we have p bigger than or equal to 11. Then we use that to show that p was less than or equal to 3m plus 2 by plugging into this red underlined equation. Now off the chalkboard, I have done a little arithmetic calculation on this final inequality from the last board in order to gain this inequality. So we have p minus 2 over 3 is less than or equal to m. Now we would like to get an inequality involving n, and that's actually not so hard to do if we take this equality, which has a built-in or statement. So let's just rewrite this as n equals mp plus 3 or n equals mp minus 3. And notice that this tells us that n is necessarily bigger than or equal to mp minus 3. So notice if it's equal to mp minus 3, well then it's equal. But if it's equal to mp plus 3, then it is bigger than or equal. So either one of these implies this inequality right here. That inequality is obviously a little looser of a restriction than this, but this is all we need in this case. Okay, great. Now the next thing that we want to do is manipulate the right-hand side of this. So I'll just say that we're going to build the right-hand side of this until it looks like mp minus 3. So I'll just write until it equals mp minus 3. So let's see what we get when we do that. So I'm just going to rewrite this thing. This is p minus 2 over 3 is less than or equal to m. So to make it mp minus 3, we first need to multiply by p, and then we need to subtract 3. So we get that right there. But now we know that mp minus 3 is less than or equal to n, so I can just extend this down to n on the right-hand side. So now we'll combine the extreme left-hand side of this inequality. That will give us p squared minus 2p minus 9 over 3, and that's going to be less than or equal to n. Now we're going to split this up into two more cases. I'm going to go ahead and bring that to the top and we'll continue on. On the last chalkboard, we found an inequality involving n and p where n squared was equal to this combination of p given by the problem. We had that p squared minus 2p minus 9 all over 3 needed to be less than or equal to n. Now this next step may seem like it comes out of nowhere, but I want to tell you the motivation for it. So our motivation is to find a range for the n values that makes this inequality easy to solve. In other words, easy to solve for p. So recall that we want to get values of p here, so this n should depend on p. So what we want to do is take n equal to some function of p, look at the cases when n is less than or equal to that function of p, and the cases when n is bigger than or equal to that function of p, solve each of them for p, and get some bound on the size of our prime p. So it turns out what works here is p squared over 4. So that will build our first case. n is less than or equal to p squared over 4. And so now notice that that 
can be put into this inequality to tell us that p squared minus 2p minus 9 over 3 is less than or equal to p squared over 4. Just extending this inequality out to the right a little bit. So now notice that this is going to tell us that 4p squared minus 8p minus 36 is less than or equal to 3p squared just by cross multiplication. So now I can further write that as p squared minus 8p minus 36 is less than or equal to 0. So notice that if we find the roots of the quadratic equation x squared minus 8x minus 36 equals 0, then that will give us some bound of p. So notice the graph of this is some sort of parabola. So maybe the parabola looks like that. Great. We want to look for when this parabola is below the x-axis and take only the p values that are below that point. So here is the positive root. Great. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So now we can solve this with the quadratic formula. That's actually not too hard to do. So here we get x equals, so that'll be negative b. That'll be 8 plus minus the square root of, so that's going to be 64, 8 squared, I guess negative 8 squared. And then we have 4 times a times c, so that's going to be 4 times 36, which is 144. Great, and then that's going to be all over 2. But then by some fairly standard calculations, we see that that is equal to 4 plus minus 2 times the square root of 13. Now we're going to go ahead and take this positive root and notice that that means the positive root, maybe I'll put x sub plus to mean the positive root here, is going to be between, we'll make an approximation, so the first approximation will be the square root of 13 equals 3, so obviously that's going to be the lower bound, so that's going to give us a 10 here. And then the second approximation will be the square root of 13 equals 4, so that'll give us an upper bound. So we have the positive root is between 10 and 12. But that tells us that our prime number has to be less than or equal to 12. In other words, our prime number is less than or equal to 11. Okay, great. So now I'll go ahead and clean this up and we'll look at the second case. Now we're ready to look at our second case. That is the case when n is bigger than p squared over 4. So I can go ahead and rewrite that trivially as p squared over 4 is less than n. Now we can square both sides of that inequality, and that will give us p to the fourth over 16 is less than n squared. And we did that because we know exactly what n squared should be equal to, should be equal to this stuff over here involving p cubed. So in other words, we have this is equal to p cubed minus 4p plus 9. So the next thing that I'll do is multiply both sides by 16. That'll give me p to the fourth is less than 16p cubed. And then I'll have 64p minus 144. And I'm going to go ahead and subtract that whole thing. So I'll just distribute a minus sign out of that. Now I'll divide both sides by p cubed. That's going to help me get a bound for p. So notice dividing both sides of this by p cubed will give us p on the left hand side. And then on the right hand side, it'll give us 16 minus this big fraction 64p minus 144 all over p cubed. But then for the values of p that we're looking at, which are p bigger than or equal to 11 by one of our original assumptions, we know that this bit right here will always be positive. So we're doing 16 minus a positive number, which tells us that uh, p in fact is less than 16. But if p is a prime less than 16, then that tells us that p has to be less than or equal to 13, because 13 is the largest prime, which is less than or equal to 16. So from everything we've done, our original assumption and these two inequalities, we know that p has to be less than or equal to 13. So in other words, we only have a few cases that p can be. It can be th 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and 
13. Great. And now we just have to check those one at a time. And I'll actually let you guys do that. Put these values of P into our starting equation and see what we get. And it's not too hard to see that what works is P equals two, P equals seven, and P equals 11. Those are the only values that P can be in order to get a perfect square. And that's a good place to stop.